Good evening, friends, and a warm welcome from the Observer Research Foundation team. I'm privileged to introduce I'm privileged to introduce Dr. Amitava Mukherjee. Dr. Mukherjee has over 35 years experience in development. He is presently a senior expert at the Microeconomic Policy and Development Division of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. In addition, he has served as advisor and project head of the Planning Commission of India project on decentralized planning. He has been consultant to international agencies like UNDP, FAO Rome, DFID of the Government of UK, CARE. He was also principal expert on, on the research on food safety of the Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine, University of London, as well as spokesperson for NGOs at World Summit for Social Development, Copenhagen in 1995, and at the World Food Summit in November 96. We are privileged to have him here today for a talk in which he will shed light on approaches and field experiences of community empowerment in various countries in Asia towards addressing local food issues. Dr. Mukherjee will explain how community responses using enterprising ideas and action can be used for tackling long-term hunger and food insecurity. This will be followed by a question and session, uh, question and answer session, and we request our audience to be brief in their questions and uh, wait for the mic as we are recording this for uh, research purposes. Yeah. English, Hindi, Marathi, Urdu, Malayali, Tamil, Kannad, English. How much patience do we have? How much? How many minutes? <laughs> one hour. Huh? One hour. One hour? It's, a, it's, it's like Vipassana. If you say one hour, I won't let you go for one hour. <laughs> I, I always am fond of saying it's not a cinema. That you can go out any time. If you say one hour, we have to stay one. If you say half an hour, half, I'm happy. I can, I'm prepared to talk to you all night. Okay, I will I will I will confine myself one hour to finish it quickly. Now what I'm going to tell you today is something which I've learned from the people for many, many years. Food security is my passion. Uh, right now my chart in the UN is Afghanistan, Myanmar and, and North Korea. It has food security issues, but food security is my passion. So, let me first uh, start with. Can you see this picture? Yes. What does it show you? Plenty of food. Huh? Food arranged on banana leaves. Okay, that's, that's the. Okay, that's the. the uh, and it's. Or other food samples. Okay, food samples. Samples, samples. Abundance of food. Huh? Abundance of food. Behind is the fruits and in the front is the vegetables. Okay, there we have got a banana. This is white food marker, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, banana leaves. What else? English is not my native language, so uh, I make mistakes. Okay. What is what is this? This is all the management of this picture. What is the substance of the picture? Food is being offered to some God. God. That's saying the management of the picture. Yes. What is the substance of the picture? Waste of food. Sorry? Waste of food. Eat food in small quantities. So that different variety of foods are available. He deserves the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> <Not correct. laughs> food of different, different varieties. When you say food security, that means food of different varieties should be available to you. <coughs> food is not only rice, food is not only wheat, food is not only banana, food is not mango, food is not onion, food is not different varieties. So as I was telling this group earlier, one of my doctors once told me that when you 
you will know you have been nutritious food when your plate is naturally colorful. That means your food with the different colors that have different nutritive value. So that's when you say food security means that food is available with the different colors. So what is what is the magnitude of the problem? See, I, I, was, I was given to understand on, on, on this uh, on that uh, talk about the Asia Pacific. Uh, we are the hungriest continent in the world. But unfortunately, the international community has a lot of focus on Africa. The total number of hungry people in India is more than the total population of Africa. That's the magnitude of the problem. We have 578 million of the world, 925 million more hungry people in Asia. This is a big, big issue. Now, some, for instance, uh, more than 60% of the world undernourished lived in South Asia alone, which is a huge issue. Now, what is food security? Food security means people have, at all times, access to nutritious food that is culturally acceptable for a healthy and normal life. Food security can be at the household level. Food security can be at the community level, it can be at the state level, it can be at the national level. At times, if you have food security at the national level, you still may not have food security at the household level. Yes? yes. How? Income. Uneven distribution. Income, less income. Household and income also. Poor salary. No, so a good salary also. Correct. Intra household distribution of power. Even when there is food security at the national level, even when the family has a purchasing power, even when the income level is good, still there is food insecurity in the household. When there is intra family distribution of power. Traditionally, the mother in law always controlled the food purse. My, I was saying my mother always ate last, <coughs> least and left to work. never took care of what she, what she ate. My father was well to do. He came from well to do family. If I can tell you how well to do we were, my, 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 uh, my, our house in Hazari Park hosted all the great leaders. Tagore himself used to go and stay there, Rabindranath Tagore. Subhash Chandra Bose stayed there. The Ramgar family, Jawaharlal Nehru, Balu Bhai Desai, Rajendra Prasad, they all came. So we are very well to do. But we never cared what the mother ate. I'm sure when these people came, there would have been lavish parties. But we never cared. So, how do mother ate? So, what I say is that food can be, when you say food security, it must be food security at the household level. They are a country. Or in India, if you take the aggregate picture in India, we are shining India. We have produced enough food, but we have the largest number of undernourished people. So that's good. So if you look at the elements of food security, food, you must food must be available. That's the first thing, right? You must produce food. Second is people must have economic access. That is purchasing power. You must have employment. You can be also by transfer. That means poor, the old people, widows, they can have pension, transfer entitlement, but they must have purchasing power, not necessarily for the economic alone. There must be social access. That means there should be no artificial social obstacles to accessing food like gender discrimination. <coughs> Fourth, there must be physical access. Food that is sold in a shop and out there must be easily accessible. If you look at the, I, I worked for a long time in Missouri, in up at the Himalayas. So if there will be a ration shop in one village which will cater to 20 villages. Because the catchment is small. Villages have very small population. So one village which has a ration shop, everybody has free access, physical access. In other cases they have to cross a ridge or some have to cross a 
river, so I'm going to go through a forest and an axis. Many can't do it because of age, infirmity, or whatever. There must be physical utilization of food, drinking water and sanitation. You have good food, yeah, sorry, if you have food available, you have purchasing power, there is social access, there is physical access, but if you do not have good sanitation and drinking water, you will not have food security because it will lead to waterborne diseases and there will be wastage. So finally, food must be available, food must be stability in food. But there should not be any seasonality. Sometimes more food, sometimes that cannot happen. Now I have not touched that. There are many causes of food security. One, the first cause is poverty. Okay, I'm not getting into that. The second is gender-based inequality, second major cause. First is mortality-based food insecurity. <coughs> That's the first kind of food insecurity that a woman faces. Now in the march of science, I can figure out the gender of my child. And if it's a girl child, there are ways to abort the fetus. And if somehow I don't, I'm not able to abort the fetus when the girl child is born, she is born at a disadvantaged position because the mother doesn't want the child. And if what I don't want, I don't value. Then you have natality based food insecurities. Women are, <coughs> women cannot access health unless accompanied or sanctioned by a male member in the house. And often, women, girl, child, the thought of access to that kind of health because so I come from Jharkhand, the state, they say, Are you paraya ka dhana? You know, girl is somebody else's wealth. It's maybe it's not kharcha karne ka nahi hai. Third, basic facility inequality based food security. The basic facility is available. I am more, the parents are more inclined to send the girl to male child to a school than a, a female child. Even if the girl child doesn't study, they don't, they're not very bothered. I'm not talking the urban country, talking of 80 to 70 percent of India. There are special facilities, inequality based food insecurity. When there are special colleges like engineering colleges or medical colleges, the number of students, the, the percentage of women is very, very small vis a vis the percentage of uh, students, uh, percentage of male students. I SFC, take the science higher civil services. I used to teach in the National Academy of Missouri, I know. 8 to 10 percent of the total number of IS officers used to be women. Only. And I realized it when one of the professionals was getting married, so I asked her, why are you getting married here? Uh, you could marry later. And he said, sir, if I don't get married here, I will never get married. <laughs> a deputy commissioner, if I become a district magistrate, I won't find because there are not so the proportion is very... Then you have professional bias based food insecurity. Certain professions are thought to be not for women. They are thought to be for men. Even now in the army, you know, women are not allowed in certain categories of service. Then ownership bias based food insecurity. Assets still are owned by the male. He decides. Even when in an agricultural household, when the woman makes 60 to 65 percent of the contribution to produce the food, the sale of the product is by the man. He goes to the market to sell. And then with that money, I, my wife produces, I go to the market, I sell the product, I do whatever I want to do. I go to the movie, drink to my heart content, buy my packs of, pack of cigarettes, uh, maybe a good shirt. Hey. Then you have intra-household power based food insecurity. Within the household there are intra-household power who controls the food powers. And finally seasonality, seasonality based food insecurity. There are certain seasons when food is less available and women are the hit, hit most. The, 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 the season when, when food is least available is the cultivation season. You know, it's in, in June, July, August. And then the energy requirement from the women are also the maximum because they do most of the agricultural operations. But the food availability is very, very small. So these are the eight kinds of food security faced by women. Then the third cause is risks. Right? 
the riskiest, they are the, most of the, in India, most of the farmers are still small and marginal farmers. And they have weather uncertainty, they have market related risk, they have uncertainty on cost of cultivation, ill health, sudden loss of limb, they have risk, political risk, they have policy risks, there is the risk of declining market of surplus, and they don't have any insurance. Right? Now, if you have any question, please ask me then. This, this uh, observer research foundation has spent a lot of money bringing me here. I want to give you back your money's worth. If you have questions, please ask me the question. But coming back, you forget the questions, right? A question? No, please, we can do it later on, but on the way also, if you do this, your understanding will be better, right? We will we'll not get into the debate, but... Uh, <laughs> now, community-based responses to food security are related to risks. Right? They, there is a dis distinction between risks and shocks. What is the risk and what is the shock? Anybody? Risk is you take a chance. Shock is after the chance it doesn't materialize, you get a shock. Okay, risk is the is the is the potential for a shock. And shock is when the actual shock takes place. Right? That's right. Now the community-based responses are all related to shocks. Now there can be two kinds of shocks. One is idiosyncratic shocks or uh, second is uh, covariant shocks. Idiosyncratic shocks are shocks that affect an individual household. I fall sick as a farmer. My buffalo dies. My plow breaks down. These are all idiosyncratic shocks. Covariant shocks are shocks which are suffered by many people. Floods, droughts, pest attack, policy changes. Right? These are all covariant shocks. I am not going into the detail there. I have already spoken about this. Problem with covariant shocks, you know, you cannot insure them. There is no insurance against floods. There is no insurance against an epidemic, no insurance company will insure it because the, the cost to the insurance company will be very high. They can insure it, but the premium will be very, very high. For instance, in India, we have a crop insurance, but it is highly subsidized by the state. If the state does not subsidize, farmers cannot buy that insurance. So covariate shocks, shocks which affect the whole community, there is no insurance against the earthquake. Individual I can buy. But the community as a whole you cannot buy. Now, idiosyncratic shocks, this is the one which can be effectively managed within a community. If you fall sick, your neighbor can work for you in the farm. If, you're, if your bullock has died, your friend can lend you a pair of bullocks after his agriculture operation is through to plow the field. So, and to do so, communities have developed their own norms. And these norms work most of the time. Now, what does the state do? State has various insurance system. And essentially, states always deal with covariant shocks. The state deals with earthquakes, state deals with drought. Now, currently, drought is on. So, there is, you see, X, X hundred, X thousand crores is granted by the Prime Minister. For this state, X, X thousand crores is granted by the Prime Minister. That state. So, these are all. But idiosyncratic shocks, the state does not deal with. That's left to the community. It has happened that also, for instance, the, the droughts in Vietnam and Australia in 2007, or the 
or the Sichuan earthquake in China in 2008, or the tsunami in, in the Indian Ocean affecting Indonesia, Bangladesh, Burma, India, right up to Ethiopia. They are all, in 2005, they are all covariant shocks. But the research shows that most of the food insecurity emanates from idiosyncratic shocks. Covariate shocks, they, are, they, are, they, they kind of hit you on the face so suddenly that you, you immediately take notice of it. You know how many people die of hunger every day in, in the world? No? Have you ever heard of Kanishka crash? Yeah. Air India? Yeah. Yes. So, the number of people who die every year, every day in the world is equal to two jumbo jets crashing. But we take no notice of it. When a jumbo jet crashes, all the newspapers, all the channels, everywhere, you know, oh, this crash, so many people died, so many people died. So covariate shocks are like that. When there is a flood, everybody is, takes notice of it. The media takes notice of it. If, the, if, the, if there is a drought in India today, everybody is aware of it. Every day you see the newspapers saying that the rain is deficient by 20%. The meteorological department is saying the rain is deficient by 10%. But you don't see report people, uh, reports how many people died of hunger today in Maharashtra. People have died. How many people have died of hunger in West Bengal? How many people have died of hunger in, in Uttar Pradesh? For that matter, all over the country. So that's, that's the problem. So that's the, because of that, we need to community responses. Now, what is a community? This is a perpetual debate. I have a particular way of defining a community. No, you may not agree with it, you may agree with it, that's fine, you may have your own way of fine. My, my uh, uh, definition of communities is that they are, they are individuals and institutions who have a common interest. Right? So common and which are informal, non-market character. Linked by language, ethnicity, religion, occupation, historical location of habitation, etc., etc., etc. We say community of farmers. They have a common interest. Community of drunkards. They have a common interest. Right? To drink. So, so this is that the community. It, it is not a geographical concept. Yes. See, essential characteristic of a community is the informal character and non-market character. Raj is the formal character. It is the third tier of government within the constitutional framework. It is not informal. It is a formal institution. It has an election. It has a law. It has bylaws. It has a budget. So it is no longer informal. So the essential, uh, essential feature of a community is informal in character, normal. Like you don't say community of corporations, right? You have associate, you have FICI, you have CII, but they are all formal structures. They are market based, that's the difference. CII, I won't consider that as a community, but it is a group of institutions linked by common interest because it is a formal structure. Sir, yes. the community is a tribe of people and FICI, CII, they are a club of people. They are, gathering, they are gathering a club and community is a tribe of people, group of people, a tribe. I don't want to debate that, you can tax your people the way of, if you think that is comfortable, fine. I am quite, quite happy with that. The second thing is, the, in, the inputs in a community, 
or anything is all managed by the community itself. In a corporation, the owners don't manage the corporation. The corporation is managed by a higher managers, the board of directors, they hire a group of managers, general manager, president, whatever, whatever. The shareholders don't manage it. But in case of community, all actions are put in place to manage the groups for their protection for the They do it themselves. Then the safety management. The key criteria is common interest. So when you say that the question asks, I'm spending time on that, what is the community? Community is a group of informal non-market structure of people who are bound by common interest. Community of doctors. Right? Community of health workers. Community of agriculturists. Sir, so, community is a commune and doctors are carders. They are carders. Similarity and familiarity. They all doctors sit together, all CS sit together. They are professional of carders. And a community is a commune of tribes. I have again debate with you on that, how you look at it. So long as we, are, we agree and we understand what is meant by community, I am happy to come. Right? You, know, you can get into the debate. That's according to the politics, I would much rather concentrate on the, on the substance of it. You know? The essential meaning is community is an informal structure of people who manage their own affair. It is they have common interest. That is that the community. It, does, it is not a geographical thing. It is not a village, not a people. Now there are various community interventions that I have seen uh, in many countries. First is for the vertical and horizontal farming. I will come to that. That's, that is the one community response for food insecurity. Second is duck and rice in Japan where they cultivate that together and come to that. Then in China, along the Pearl River, they have dikes and ponds. They get a community response. Then in, in, in Indonesia, in Bali, they have the weirs, small dams managed by temples. How are they doing? We have grain banks, seed banks and tool banks. This is our seva. We have common property resources community tides over their difficult situation by accessing common property resources. Cutting consumption, food, education, health, and finally migration. <coughs> the sort of society? Sorry? Society, you form the society, is that communities uh, form the society? When you form a society, sir, it becomes a formal society. Applies to the community also? You, you, you may define, but community, as I understand, is an informal structure. Community of potters, community of weavers, community of uh, poultry farmers. The society is a formal structure. It has rules. It is not then it is not managed by itself because it can manage itself, but it is subject to rules. The rules. Then they, then they, Yes, any question here? Uh, I would say, is there an element of collective decision making? Yeah, that's right. When, how it, it manages itself, that's collective decision. If you look at my earlier slide. Sorry. All coordinated actions are put in place and manage the group for their protection benefit. It is collective decision making. Formal structure. Gram Sabha under the Panchayat Act, Act is enjoined in the Constitution, 73rd and 74th Constitution, the formal structure. But if you look at his, Dharampal's history of Panchayats, we had Panchayats uh, thousands of years ago. They are all informal structures. In a very pejorative sense, the Khap Panchayats are all informal structures. But, but, but that's not a good example. Let us take the case of this, uh, a case of community response in China. China had 
until 1978, a communal a, a, a system of communes. Even now, all land belongs to the state. And land was cultivated by the farmers together. Output will be together, there will be common output, which will be shared by the people according to the state law. There were the provinces in uh, central China called Anhui. There, in around 1978, people earned between 1 to 10 work points a day. One work point was equal to 1 yuan. Each one make a dollar. So the maximum you can earn in a day is one dollar. In 78 I'm talking about. Farmers cannot leave their commune. If you belong to a commune on Marine Drive, you have to live in Marine Drive. You cannot go to Bandra. Similarly, a farmer of Bandra cannot go to Mulun. A farmer of Mulun cannot go to Varsova. They all now, when this happens, when everybody cultivates the land, when everybody shares, produce, I have little interest. It becomes nobody's business.